let us start with hardware challenges, right? So as we saw, we have more and more data and to train our networks. We saw that in ResNet 50, that has like 23 million trainable parameters. So we need to read more and more data from the memory, right? So GPU is nothing but lots and lots, thousands of compute cores. And if you want to do any useful computation with data using those cores, what you need to do is to move the data from the memory all the way into the compute cores, perform the computation, and then write back the result into the memory. So, which is expensive, right? You have more and more data, so you're doing lots of reads and writes to the memory. So that itself is a big challenge because the data pipe, that is the pipe between the memory and your compute cores, you can think of, at some point, when we stop more and more compute cores, the reading and writing to memory is going to be a big bottleneck because you can only read and write at certain speed and that is dictated by physics, right? Moment of electrons and so on. So at some point, you will anyway have a bottleneck. And these parameters and models also keep growing and reading and to and fro memory is very expensive with respect to both time and power. Uh, this is a slide from Bill Daly's talk. It's already, you see, you see it's five years old. It shows how much energy is spent in computation, the green box, compared to the energy spent in reading the operands to do the computation. So you see that you spend 20 picojoules to do some 64-bit computation, but in order to do the computation, you spend 16 nanojoules to read operands from the memory right, 16 nanojoules is 16,000 picojoules. So you are spending 16,000 picojoules to do some operation that is only 20 picojoules, all right? So it's a lot of effort. So more uh, read and write you do to memory, the more power you're going to burn, right? And at some point it's going to hit your efficiency. And there are also evolving, and you can build bigger chips as we'll see, there are some people who are building it, but again, you have to be very conscious of the power that you spend. And there are also some evolving techniques um, that the underlying hardware architecture needs to be aware of. So hardware is not like software, right? When you're building hardware, you cannot sell a patch. You cannot say, oh, this is the patch, you download it and your hardware will have a new functionality, correct? It's mostly many things are baked in, although you can control certain things using some registers, but most of the code functionality is baked in to the silicon, right? So you need to think about many of these evolving techniques like quantization, mixed precision training, and so on, when you build the architecture so that the SDK of your compute platform can make use of the hardware architecture when they use all these features, right? So these are all the challenges. You may think that, oh, all the challenges, it's only one slide worth. No, these are lots, right? If you think about it, each and every of these challenge um, may require several thousand engineers or several years or several techniques to overcome. So what are the people doing about it? What are the trends in hardware, right? So there are some people who are really bold enough to build bigger processors. And this is the Cerebras processor. As you see, you would have heard about the Cerebras computer and that company. It is 56 times the size of a GPU. Just to put it in perspective, right? The pan that I use to make omelet is eight inches in diameter. And this guy is bigger than that. As you see, it's eight and a half inches, correct? So just imagine the size. Just imagine, and you could even stack up several of these things and achieve more parallelism, correct? And the also model compression techniques, this is more in the case of inference side uh, because the model keeps growing bigger and bigger and you may want to fit it in a small chip, an inference chip. So people try to do some compression, like if there are lots of sparse matrices, lots of zeros, then the hardware should be able to detect it and kind of squash it because you don't achieve anything by having zero rows or zero columns when you multiply matrices. So these are the things, again, you need to keep in mind when you build hardware. So there are lots of these techniques that are getting into computer architecture, like hardware design, right? And there's also this in-memory computing. Uh, this has been in research for a very long time, but there's considerable interest in this very lately. 
right? The idea being that instead of moving data, we saw in the previous slide that moving data is very, very expensive. Instead of moving data, which is very energy, uh, the cost of energy for moving data is very high. Why don't we just move compute to the place where data resides? So, which is the memory, right? Why don't you put some cheap compute elements wherever there is the data, which is the memory, and just compute it and write back to the memory there itself, right? So there are some chips that do in memory computing, but we'll have to wait and see whether it becomes mainstream. And again, model parallelism and data parallelism, we keep generating more and more data. So now what do you do? You divide the network into several pieces and distribute them to a cluster of GPUs and train them and then correlate the results, just like how AWS or um, you know, cloud com the distributed computing does, right? Or you can even divide the data and distribute it to different machines, right? You have this model parallelism and data parallelism. These are not very new, but they are still trying to get the best model parallelism, best data parallelism, the best batch size and so on, right? And now you also talk about binary quantization and hardware and compiler optimizations. So these are also some of the things that you need to keep in mind while designing your hardware. So I would say that if you are interested in computer architecture, this is the best time to be a computer architect because it's very challenging and you will learn a lot just by being a computer architect. You will know about programming languages, you will know about hardware, you will know about optimization techniques, core mathematics, but you, you may want to use some, some of those techniques to make sure the register utilization and allocation is optimal, right? So now we saw some hardware trends and challenges. Uh, it's not that software is without any challenge, right? And it is expected, it is very obvious. So because if I ask you what's your favorite programming language, very likely your answer is going to be something like, ah, I don't see, I'm good at Java, I'm learning to write Python because of deep learning, but my company uses Julia. It is something to that effect, right? Most of us. And that is okay, that's how it is, right? And that's how it has always been. And similarly, only when you talk about deep learning, there are different frameworks, TensorFlow, KRS, PyTorch, and all those things. And some of them claim to be great for research and some others claim to be great for production and deployment, but which one is better? You will never get a clear answer because there isn't one. It depends on lots of other factors, right? And there are also different optimizing compilers for inference, right? Again, which one is the best optimizing compiler? It depends on the network. It depends on your, it depends on several other factors. And there are also different applications that require different algorithms. Uh, but itself is new, right? It's for language processing. And I think it came in 2019 or end of 2018. But now you have several variants for each domain, BioBird for biology and VideoBird for video and so on, right? So again, which one is the best? It depends on several factors, mainly your domain, correct? Right? And there are also evolving algorithms. The, it's new revolutionary algorithms which try to borrow techniques from other domains and apply it for this deep learning and so on. So these are not only software challenges, but now if you ask me, why don't we just build a chip that is very good for image processing and just sell it to Facebook and all other people who are doing image processing, right? Um, or image classification. That itself, the software challenge is, is the reason because the algorithms keep evolving. The algorithm is not stable. So by the time you design a chip and build it, the algorithm would have evolved and there might be a better algorithm and your hardware would be of no use. So once the algorithm stabilize, only then you can think about the building a application specific chip to handle that, right? So there are these evolving algorithms and there are also different infrastructures. You wouldn't be happy if your accuracy is going to drop when you move from one infrastructure to the other, right? If you move from cloud GPUs to cloud TPUs, you would expect that your accuracy to go up or at least stay the same and not drop, right? This is another challenge because 
the most of the workloads are moving to the cloud and you don't want to lose anything just by doing that. 